Welcome back to another Q&A video. As always, everything is timestamped, and if you have any questions, leave them down below. So with that said, let's get started. Hey Alex, what do you think about push pressing with bands for big arms? All right, I think this is a very intelligent idea. For the first reason, push pressing in itself is gonna overload your triceps. Everybody knows this, that's what it does. It overloads your triceps on the concentric, so it brings you from about the chest level to your mid forehead, so you're locking out heavy weights, and you get the eccentric overload. So when you're lowering about 15% more than what you can strict press, that's gonna build your triceps, right? Now, when you attach bands to an exercise, it's gonna accomplish a few things. Number one, it's going to perfect the strength curve. It's gonna be more difficult throughout the entire range of motion. On top of that, the lockout will be really, really, really difficult. Depending on which tension you use, bands could add significant amounts of weight. So that lockout is gonna be overloaded more than if you did it with straight weights. Uh, there's gonna be less body deceleration because bands push the deceleration curve higher. And then the best part of all, the eccentric overload will be maximized because bands pull you down. So now you're locking out this heavy weight and it's pulling you down while you lower it a bit slowly, right? So that's obviously gonna build your triceps. So yeah, for mass building purposes and even athletic performance, I would say the push press with bands is definitely up there. Can neck training fix double chin or at least minimize it? Like, will it make my fluffy chin look better or will it make it only look worse? Okay, neck training will make you look leaner in the face. The first reason is that the fat around your neck will distribute through a larger surface area. See, let's say you build lean 18 inch arms, right? And then you decide to bulk up to 30% body fat. You just, you lose control with your diet, become fat as hell. So now your arms are 20 inches. Guess what? Those arms are not gonna look like fat guy arms. They are going to look muscular. Of course, they're gonna be a little bit soft, but they're gonna be freaking huge and muscular looking and it's not gonna look bad. Well, the same thing applies to the neck. If you get a really big neck, which it could be done, you can get a lean 18 inch neck, no problem. If you do that, and now you bulk up your body fat a little bit to the point where you're fluffy, well, now your neck might be 19, but most of it is muscle, so it doesn't really look that fat, you understand? So it distributes the fat through a larger surface area. On top of that, it becomes more even with your chubby cheeks, so it makes your face look less round. If you have these huge chubby cheeks with a skinny neck, you look like a freaking lollipop. But if you have a wide neck with chubby cheeks to go with it, guess what? It creates that thumb effect. And a good example of this would actually be uh, Bill Goldberg. Bill Goldberg has big cheeks. We're not necessarily big, but they're on the rounder side. Take a look at this picture. You see his cheeks are on the rounder side? Well, the only reason why he looks like a thumb is because his neck is wide. So, neck training will enhance your facial aesthetics. It'll accentuate your jaw. It's very, very important um, if you want to look better. Is there any full body dumbbell programs that you would recommend? In terms of programs, by themselves, like I can't think of any in particular. However, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do a dumbbell exclusive system. You just have to understand exercise science, understand proper programming, and create your own system around these principles. So if you want to create a dumbbell only program, do a dumbbell bench press, do a shoulder press, do a dumbbell row, you know, do maybe a pullover as well, um, hit some bicep curls one arm, overhead extension one arm, very easy to manage. And then for the legs, Maybe you could uh, do a belt squat or something with a heavy dumbbell hanging between, you know, or goblet squats for higher reps or reverse lunges for higher reps, you know. There's always creative things that you could do. You just have to think, isolate yourself, right? Think deep, find out ways of structuring your program. But as long as you have like the primal movement patterns down, you know, horizontal press, horizontal pull, vertical pull, vertical push, and then you have the twisting, the bending. Basically, if your system is balanced and... Uh, you're having a good exercise selection as well, and it's time-tested exercises, you should be fine. And that can definitely be done with an all-dumbbell program. I've written plenty for guys, and it was always a beautiful thing. Another thing too, right? If you have a home gym, and you don't have like really heavy dumbbells, you can always choose very difficult variations of exercises, like um, the seated one-arm Z-press. So you sit down on the floor with a dumbbell, square chest, overhead press strict. Fantastic exercise. If you do it for volume, you're not gonna be able to go that heavy. So. There are creative ways of structuring your program. You don't have to use barbells if you don't want to, although I do believe barbells are generally superior. So yeah, you can do a dumbbell program, just get creative, design it yourself. Will bodybuilding powerlifting affect my parkour gymnastics performance in a bad way? Okay, I would say yes. Okay, for one, powerlifting, 
the squat and the deadlift is a huge part of it, right? It makes two thirds of your total. So that is going to negatively impact your gymnastics 100% because the bigger your legs are, the more mass you got down there, the more it negatively impacts your leverages. That's why a lot of gymnasts try to avoid leg training as much as possible. They might do some conditioning work for the legs or stuff like Jefferson curls. You know, they're going to do mobility for the legs and they're definitely very flexible and they have some decent strength. They might squat in the 315 range, but they're not on a powerlifter level. If you actually are an elite powerlifter, you're squatting the 500 range, dude, your legs are going to cause problems. Like if you take a guy like Candido, for instance, and you make him do a gymnastics program, he's going to have difficulties managing the planche and a lot of other movements like front levers and stuff like that. It has to do with leverages. So for that reason alone, I would say powerlifting is not optimal for that purpose, you know? Um, another thing too, in regards to bodybuilding, a lot of bodybuilding programs are very like not functional in a sense. Lots of machine work, lots of uh, fluff and pump, lightweight stuff. And it's just, you're not going to be the strongest guy or have the best structural integrity. So if you start doing stuff like planches and gymnastic rings, you might not be that strong. You might have a very difficult time. I wouldn't say it's because of the bodybuilding itself. It's just that you have all this muscle and dead weight and um, you don't really have like that specific performance. You have to understand that relative strength, you have to train for a dude. And I, I think that's the reason why guys like Cali Muscle can still do muscle ups and all kinds of moves like that at a high body weight because back in prison when he was a leaner guy and he was a lot smaller, he used to do it. And he kept it up with all these years to the point where he can still do it now. But if you already take a guy who's close to his genetic max, like he built a ton of muscle or he's a competitive powerlifter, and now you start him straight into calisthenics, I think he's going to have a difficult time, all right? That's just my personal opinion. I think that it is valid what I'm saying, and I've also experienced it myself, you know? When I used to do uh, parkour and calisthenics back in the day, it was a lot easier when I was a little 140-pound guy compared to now. When your legs get bigger, it plays an effect, and the more muscle you have, the harder it's going to be. A lot of these moves are done by lightweights. A lot of gymnasts, male gymnasts, 140, 160 pounds. When you're in the 180 range like me, it's more difficult. Of course, it could be done. We got guys like Dan Jong, okay, fitness FAQs, guys who are actually jacked, Mechanimal, shout out to him, you know. Um, so I'm not saying that it's not possible. And of course, in the parkour world, tricking world, we got Clarence Kendi, uh, Juji Mufu. So these dudes exist, but I'm just saying on average, it wouldn't be in your best interest to be an elite level powerlifter or an elite bodybuilder. That should have negative impacts on your performance if you're trying to excel at it. So yeah, next question. Why are four inch block pulls so much harder than rack pulls at the same height? Okay, it has to do with the way the plates are uh, dispersed, right? When you pull in a rack, number one, you got steel on steel, right? That immediately takes the slack out of the bar, which means that breaking the weight off the pins is gonna be easier. It's easier to get a weight moving off a rack than it is off blocks because with blocks, it's as if you're doing it on the floor. The only difference is that it's elevated a little bit. So you're getting less range of motion, but it's still very similar to a pull off the floor. And that's why a lot of powerlifters recommend that you do block pulls to raise your deadlift because it is specific in that way. And personally, I found that block pulls do have better carryover to pulls off the floor compared to rack pulls. So the main difference is the fact that the rack, the slack is pulled out, it's easier to break off, right? And also in the rack too, like, the bar is floating. So you have plates that are not even on the ground. They're not, you get what I'm saying? They're not down. So it's, al it's almost as if you're pulling with a shorter bar. That's kind of what it replicates when you do in the rack. So that's why if you pull the same height, you will do less with a block. Block pulls are generally harder than rack pulls. Hey Alex, I'm currently doing your beginner knowledge program and I've noticed my left tricep is bigger than my right. Should I do isolation exercises for my right triceps? Thanks. Okay, very common question, very common situation. Here's the deal. If you're running my novice program and you actually are a beginner lifter, this imbalance that you have is pretty normal and it's nothing to worry about because right now, your entire physique is lagging. You don't have one arm that's that much bigger than the other, okay? You, you have small arms, period. And that's just a reality thing. So what you need to do is quit worrying about your imbalanced arms and just focus on getting stronger and putting on some mass. And over time, you're gonna see those arms are really not that imbalanced. I see it too many times where there's a beginner who's gonna send me a picture, Alex, my arms are very uneven. I'm like, dude, they don't look that different. And chances are, you're probably the only person who notices this difference, all right? I know because I speak from experience. I used to do the same thing and I've seen it thousands of times, right? So your arms are probably not lagging in terms of like one being bigger than the other. It's just that they're lagging, period. 
you need to put on more mass. So I would say leave all that specialization stuff for later. Focus on reaching the intermediate stage, you know, get stronger, get bigger. And then if you actually do have a real muscular imbalance, then obviously uh, you can take measures to improve that. But right now, as a beginner, I would say you just need to work more on your foundation. Don't try to chisel a pebble. What do you think about trap bar shrugs with leg drive? Good exercise for trap development? Yes, that's actually my favorite way to perform the shrug. Because when you do a standard barbell shrug from the front, for a lot of people, myself way included, it hits your balls, okay? That's just how it is. For me, whenever I pull from the front, it hits my balls. Now, if you go behind the back, guess what? Now it hits your glutes and there's less range of motion. So it's not really the best shrug from that perspective. Even, even though it does hit like the mid to lower traps a little bit better. So I found that the perfect compromise is doing the trap bar shrug. The trap bar shrug, it's neutral grip, you know, so it's easier to do even without straps. Um, you get maximum weight to stretch, really good range of motion. You don't have your body uh, blocking you because it's by your side, you know. It is a really, really good way to shrug. It is my favorite way to shrug. I think it is the best way to shrug, right, using the power style. The only limitation of the trap bar shrug, though, is the fact that a lot of them don't have long sleeves, you know. So you might tap out at 700 pounds. I would say that's the only limitation. But you know what? If you're doing 700 pounds for 20 reps, that's pretty damn good, isn't it? And you probably really don't need more than that. So trap bar shrug, definitely my favorite way to do the shrug. Hey, Alex, what do you think about heavy front squat holds for core strength? Fantastic idea. Personally, I tend to use a Zercher holds. But the problem with Zercher holds is that a lot of guys round their lower backs into it. You know, that's how they'll move the weight off the pins. They're going to round like crazy. So it might lead to a really bad posture and lower back pain. At least with the front squat hold, you got the elbows up, you got thoracic extension going on. So it's actually going to help with your upper back strength as well. And um, it also has really good carryover to other exercises, you know? Like it's going to help you on your regular front squat holds. It's going to help you for your push presses. I think it's a great exercise to do. So if you don't like Zerker holds, Try the front squat hold. I want to incorporate snatch grip deadlifts, but every time I do them, it keeps hitting my junk, mainly with heavier weights since I have to keep the bar close to my legs. Is there a solution to that? Yeah, I get it, man. My best recommendation, I'm going to give you two, okay? First of all, you want to make sure that your upper back is tight. I found that a lot of guys, when they use a snatch grip, they round their upper backs, and what happens is that the bar is no longer on their hips. It goes to their balls, right? Pay attention to people who do high reps on snatch grip lifts, right? You'll find the first few reps... It's not hitting their balls. But then towards the end, all of a sudden it's hitting it. Why? Because they're rounding their back. So now the range of motion it gets closer to your nuts. Okay? So my advice is to keep the back as tight as possible and also widen out the grip a little bit more. You might think that you're doing a snatch grip, but you're actually performing a semi-snatch grip. So widen it out until it cannot hit your nuts, even if you do round your upper back. So that's what I would say to you. Is it possible to use weighted stretching for nucleus overload? I never really thought about doing that, you know? I suppose it would work. I mean, when we looked at the bird study, for example, that's what it was. It was basically nucleus overload, weight of stretching. Weight of stretching done for extended periods of time, very excruciating pain. And there was no concentric component, um, no volume component, really. You could say it was time detention because it was really long holds. But uh, yeah, I would say maybe try it out. See how it works out for you. I've never experimented with this. Would I say it would work? Yeah, why not? So let's say you're at home, right? You want to build your long head to triceps. Take a band, put it overhead, stretch it out for like 5-10 minutes. Do that every day. See if it has an effect. How do you progressively overload if you keep changing your exercise every workout? Okay. Well, for me, I have a lot of experience and I have very good memory. So I can retain what I did. Like I know all of my PRs like by memory. But if you're not like me, then just bring a notepad to the gym. Get an app on your phone where you can track everything down. Or film your workouts. Like I have a friend who he brings a tripod and a cell phone to the gym every time. And he films everything that he does. And I'm, I'm, he only films the peak sets. He trains like Bulgarian-ish, right? So he films all his peak sets and he uploads it to his Instagram. And that's how he keeps track of all his progress. Whenever he needs to look back, he'll just go on his Instagram and he has all the clips lined up. That's a really good way to remember what you were doing. So if you don't have the best memory or you want to have it like tracked down... Instagram is a great option for that. And of course, you can gain popularity out of it. You can inspire other people. So that's what I would do. And uh, also, in regards to the programming itself, the reason why you make progress is because um, you're rotating sports-specific exercises, which automatically raises your lift. All right? So if I do a four-inch block pull, uh, 
then my two-inch block pull will also raise automatically. So when I go to the two-inch block pull, I get a PR. And then maybe if I pull off the floor next time, I get another PR. And then when I go back to the four-inch block pull, because I rotated all these specific lifts, progress is automatically ensured. So the way that you make progress is by managing your volume and intensity the correct way and rotating specific movements. That is if you're following concurrent periodization, which is what I do currently. Hey Alex, do hack rack pulls on pin one, build your yoke, neck and traps to a large extent. Uh, the neck, I wouldn't say so much, you know. I find that direct work is the best way to build your neck, you know. And uh, for me personally, I lost inches on my neck from doing heavy pulls. Like my deadlift performance increased like crazy, my rack pulls increased, but my neck shrunk. That's because I wasn't isolating it. So I wouldn't rely on it for that. But for the traps, hack rack pull pin one, fantastic movement. Really hits those mid to lower traps. And if you get stronger to say you can pull 800 pounds from that position, you're going to look pretty yoked in my opinion. So I think it's a great lift. Give it a shot. I don't have blocks or power rack, but I want to overload my poles. Any other solutions? Uh, yeah, get some bands, okay? Or aerobic steps. Uh, most gyms have aerobic steps. And if they don't, well, just buy them yourself. I mean, they shouldn't be too expensive. They might be like 10, 20 bucks max. It's gonna get you. It's gonna give you four inches. That's what I personally use for my block pulls. So aerobic steps. Uh, you can also consider plates, like rubber plates. Sometimes gyms they're gonna have like these really wide rubber plates, and you could use that for your um, your box. You know, so when you do overloads, that's gonna work. But yeah, I would say band training is probably your best bet. You can get long bands, short bands. Either way, it's gonna overload the top. It's a great substitute if you don't want to do uh, rack pulls, block pulls, etc. And it and it combines deadlifts with overload at the same time. So it's actually quite specific in that regard. Tell me your opinion on P. Rubish's neck. It's huge, man. And apparently the guy doesn't even hit his neck directly. Uh, well, yeah, he has a huge neck, but he's also a freaking 900 pound deadlifter, you know, and he's on uh, drugs. So when you have elite genetics, you're 900 pound puller and you're taking roids at the same time, you're going to have a wide neck. The guy is just a pure beast, you know, so it makes sense. And I commend him for his efforts, man. He's a really strong guy. I follow him personally. I actually did an interview with him a while back. You can check it out on this channel uh, playlist, interviews. But yeah, Pete's neck, huge. That said, though, I would say that um, a lot of you guys can hit that size naturally. You don't have to be a 900-pound polar. You don't have to take drugs. You don't need elite genetics. If you actually isolate your neck, you can acquire 19 inches, no problem, okay? So, yeah, although Pete has a great neck, it could be even bigger if he isolated it, you know? But I don't see how that would be the most beneficial thing for powerlifting, you know? But yeah, want a big neck? Isolate it. Which resistance bands would you recommend for neck training? I'm mainly going for doing neck extensions and curls with them. I would recommend a thicker band, okay? A light band, average band, maybe even a strong band. But you want to make sure that's on the thicker side. Because when you attach it to a bench, it's going to be a small range of motion. So you want to make sure that the band is thick. Otherwise, you're going to have to double it. That might be a little bit weird. So I would definitely opt for the thicker band tensions. What are some must-do exercises to keep the joints healthy? Well, I wouldn't say there's any must-dos in a sense, but uh, there are some exercises that I highly recommend, such as uh, the band face pull. I think the band face pull is excellent. It's gonna strengthen the rotator cuffs, rear delts, everything. Really, really good exercise. The band push down is gonna strengthen those elbows. Uh, it's gonna prevent pain from arising when you do heavy presses, extensions, etc. And then band curls as well will also prevent uh, elbow pain and uh, build a bicep tendon, you know? which is quite beneficial, especially if you do a mixed grip a lot. And then uh, I would also say reverse hyperextensions, very, very important, you know? Uh, it's gonna traction the spine, build the spinal rectus at the same time. It's it's just my, it's my favorite way to hit the lower back, and it also hits the hamstrings and glutes pretty nicely. So I think those will be my top exercises for now, at least at the top of my head. But I'm sure there's a lot more that I could recommend. What's your take on Scott Herman Fitness, Cheat and Recover Method? I'm a big fan of it, man. The thing is, it combines the best of all worlds. You're getting the cheat reps, you know, so you're gonna get that overload, you're gonna get all kinds of benefits from cheating, and then you're doing the strict rep right after in a drop set fashion. So I think this approach is extremely beneficial for bodybuilding, you know, and it gets, it's, it's anti-dogmatic. You're getting the cheat and the strict. To me, it's the best of all worlds. Do you think elite naturals like Bugenhagen can still make improvements to their physique? Yes, 100%. If I can give you a great example, I'll reference you my man, Twisting Nether, okay? He's been training for like 30 years, he's in his 40s, and he's still making hypertrophy gains. Uh, when his channel was still around, he released a program called uh, Nether by the Day, which was his bodybuilding system every single day, every workout, you know? And um, he was gaining mass from that. And he even said it, like, there's certain stuff that he started doing months ago, which got him bigger, like um, 
the incline shrug, which is a very weird exercise. You're like, you lean forward and you like, you shrug, you know, and it works your upper chest. So he got bigger after like 30 years and he's still getting bigger today. You know, his arms, everything's getting bigger. Now, as far as Bugenhagen goes, yeah, he can definitely get bigger. The thing is, Bulgarian is not the most optimal program for gaining size. And the thing is too, with his new job, um, he doesn't actually run the classic Bulgarian program anymore. He had to switch to an upper lower because it's specific to what he's doing. And also they have him do more exercises, you know, more bodybuilding type of stuff, particularly like hitting the side delts, uh, more upper chest, calves, and then stuff like the forms too. And I know that Bugenhagen even said that his forms were lagging. You know, even though he's a strong uh, gripper, he never really did a lot of flexion work. So I would say for him, his uh, forearms can get bigger, his calves get bigger. He can probably gain a little bit more size in other areas. But I would say he's pretty like he's pretty up there. He's pretty tapped out for the most part. But despite that, he can still gain a little bit more size. I'm trying not to hack deadlift off the floor. I'm having an issue before the lockout. The bar gets stuck under my ass and on my hamstrings. It's not a smooth pull all the way through like yours. Thoughts, cheers. Yeah, it's not smooth for me either. Uh, sometimes the bar does get caught in my hamstrings and it becomes like a weird twitchy movement. Like if you saw when I did 635, it was smooth. When I did 655, it was like I had to twitch it a little bit because it got caught up in my legs. So that could happen, you know? Um, my best recommendation is to just practice the movement more and more and find out what the best technique is for you. Because I found that like now that I got so good at the lift, I don't really experience too many issues. It's more so smooth because I perfected the technique. On top of that, I would recommend that you pull in the rack. Do the hack rack pull from pin one because now you're going to be in that exact position that you find awkward. That position where it's hitting your hamstrings, you're going to find out leverages of escaping that, right? So when you go pull off the floor, you'll be able to kind of like remember that position and kind of groove around it. So perfect your technique and consider doing pulls in the rack or pull off blocks to kind of figure out how to maneuver at the top. Is it harder to build thicker forms if they are long? Yes. The shorter your form is, the bigger it's going to look. That's one of the reasons why my forms look huge. I have really, really, really short forms and I have good insertion points as well, you know? So when I flex my form, they, they look absolutely massive. So if you're just this lanky guy with super long forms, it's obviously going to be more difficult to build them up. From an illusion standpoint, they're going to appear lankier, you know? Uh, but that said, it's not really a bad thing necessarily because typically guys with really long forms, it also means they're going to be great deadlifters. And typically as well, they have larger hands. So you might be very good at grip exercises, you know, much better than a guy like me who has these little puny hands. So, so I might have big forearms, but I got small hands. So there's a trade-off here, you know? So it's not really a bad thing because you will excel in strength. But from a bodybuilding perspective, yeah, it's not optimal. So yeah, folks, last question of the week. Alex, are you starting back gaming? Uh, not really, bro. I'm, I'm way too busy. And unfortunately, I don't really have time. I game once in a blue moon, but uh, that's rare. It's really rare. Like few times a month, if that, sometimes like none, I just don't have enough time. I'm very busy. If you, uh, if you see my emails, like it's, I get a lot of emails. I'm doing a lot of work for this channel. I'm basically working nonstop. And if I actually do have free time, gaming is not really my priority to be honest with you. You know, I'd rather read a book. Like sometimes I don't even have time to read, you know? So I'd rather spend my free time reading, elevating my mind, basically doing something productive. But yeah, once in a blue moon, it's good to unwind and do a bit of gaming. I'm always going to be a gamer to my heart, you know, like uh, I'm very passionate about it. I have gamer friends that I still talk to today, you know, and I think it's fantastic. But also too, um, a lot of these modern games I don't really enjoy. So I kind of tend to gravitate towards old school stuff. And a lot of those games are difficult and long and I don't really play games too often. But uh, that said, I mean, check out my Steam. Look at my hours played. Look at the, look how often I play games. You're going to see it's a very small amount. But what's crazy, though, is that uh, I've seen some guys on my friends list that got, like, fucking 10,000 hours on Counter-Strike. Like, holy fuck. I don't think there's a single game I have on Steam that's at 200 hours. I just don't do a lot of gaming anymore. I used to do it in the past when I was a gamer nerd back in the day, but I've gone past that. So, for me, it's more of a thing that I do once in a blue moon, but uh, I don't have time for gaming. There's much more important things to focus on, but once, uh, once in a while, it's good to unwind, I suppose. So, yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A video. Personally, I thought the questions were absolutely phenomenal. We got a lot of unique questions this week, and I think it would be a great disservice if you didn't listen to them all because there's a lot of good content here. So yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Let's see some more down below, and I'll talk to you all next week.